Um, my name's Tim Swift. I'm the chair of the partnership board and also deputy leader of Calderdale Council. So this is the, over, the overarching strategy board that looks at how we work together to join up our services and support and the investment we make to make the future, current and future health and care needs of, uh, of people across West Yorkshire. Uh, it's a shortened meeting today, but the agenda includes a report from our chief executive, Rob Webster. We'll be talking about the partnership agreement between the combined authority, the West Yorkshire combined authority, and the Integrated Care Board. Uh, we'll be talking about our work to support young people leaving care and a project that's being put in place to help them take up roles in the health and social care sector. We'll have an update on the People's Board and a proposal to focus the work plan of the Partnership Board for the coming year, how we we'll look at prioritising what issues we're focusing on. I know we're all familiar with these meetings by now, but if I could just remind everybody to mute your microphones when you're not presenting or speaking. Um, but please, when you are speaking, make sure your camera's on as well so that we can see you. Um, and the first time you contribute, if you just introduce yourself and remind uh, remind people what you, which organisations you're from. If people use either the raise hand or the chat function, I'll do my best to make sure we see anybody wanting to contribute or ask questions. Um, just before we move on to the formal agenda, um, I've mentioned already the the uh, the partnership report which we're going to talk about, and I'd like to welcome um, Tracy Braben, the Mayor of West Yorkshire, who should be joining us today, and Ben Still, also from uh, from Wicker, um, both of whom are joining us. I'm not sure. Is Tra Tracy? Are you online yet? Is uh... um. Councillor Swift, hello, it's Ben. Um, Tracy's, Hi, ben. Tracy's just joining in a moment, so she's not quite on yet. OK, well, perhaps we can um, ask, ask her to comment when we get to the partnership board item, if that's OK, then. Sure. Thank you. Um, and also hopefully welcome, but to note anyway, the appointment that, that uh, Councillor Cathy Scott has taken over as interim leader of, of Kirklees. Again, I'm not sure if Cathy has been able to, to join us, but clearly has uh, taken on some pretty sizable responsibilities. Um, I know we also have a number of other changes. I'm sorry if I've uh, not got anyone. Again, perhaps people can introduce people as they uh, as they go through. And um, yeah, James, and I welcome um, Dr. Bagala from the Uganda Ministry of Health, who's uh, shadowing you. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, well, welcome, Dr. Bagala. So item two is our, our normal item on questions and public deputations. Now, we didn't have notice of any questions submitted by the deadline for that. I do understand, though, that we've received um, that we've received two late questions from Dr John Puntis from Keep Our NHS Public. So what I propose to do is rather than take those now, we will um, we will provide uh, written response, written responses to those after the meeting. Item three, declarations of interest. Uh, we all recognise the importance of being transparent about our interests. Um, clearly, we all have registers of interest in our own organisations, and those declarations are uh, taken as taken as read as part of our declarations here. But if people do have specific interests in any of the items, I would urge people to mention them on those items. Item four is the minutes from the last meeting, which have been circulated. Um, I'm hoping that people are happy that they're a, ha they're a correct record. I'll look around briefly for indications otherwise. I'm not seeing any. So in that case, I'll hand over to Ian Holmes and ask Ian to update us on the action log. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swift. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Holmes. I'm Director of Strategy and Partnerships for the ICB. Um, we've just got one um, outstanding action in progress, which is something that Laura Ellis has been working on uh, with local authorities, governance leads around the approval of the, um, of, the, of the ICP terms of reference. Laura, I don't know if you're able to give a quick update on that. I think I think there's progress since last time, isn't there? Yes, uh, thank you, Ian, and I'm hoping we can close the action down. Um, just to confirm that following further discussions with all of our local authorities, it has been confirmed that we don't need to seek formal sign-off, um, so there's no further action to take on that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Cathy? Thank you, Councillor Swift. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cathy Elliott and I'm Chair of NHS West Yorkshire Integrated Care Boards. I wondered, Tim, if whether um, Ian could just share an update on the uh, focus topic that we had last time on oral health and dentistry and perhaps when the Partnership Board might hear more about this. I know for us within the Integrated Care Board, we'll be keeping track of this in terms of commissioning and resourcing. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. So um, the ICB, the West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board, um, took on responsibility for the commissioning of dental services from April this year um, from NHS England. Um, and we shared we shared with the board of the, the ICB, the West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board and the Partnership Board, um, a summary of our plans for um, addressing um, some of the access issues that we uh, know persist in dental services, recognising that those challenges are long-standing and um, will require quite a lot of uh, work to sort them out. Um, we came up with a plan um, that was endorsed by the Integrated Care Board, um, which, which focused on investing um, additional resources um, that we thought we wouldn't spend by the end of the year because there's not the, the, the dental contractors to spend the full budget. Um, so we agreed a plan to spend invest six and a half million pounds, um, which we've now agreed, and about four of that will go on improving um, access schemes, dental access schemes, um, and a, a good chunk of the rest will be spent on um, supporting um, inclusion, um, inclusion health approaches for um, dentistry, so including sort of homeless groups and um, children. We also want to invest in community dental services, recognising the long waiting lists around those. So we've come up with a plan and we are enacting that plan around um, the dental budget for 23-24, um, we're continuing to work with local authority colleagues around some of the wider um, ambitions for dental, including oral health, prevention, um, and working with the Department of Health and Social Care around testing the appetite for um, a, a Yorks and Humber approach to fluor fluoridation. So that work is is active and live. Um, we're making good progress. And, and like I say, Cathy will bring something to the um, board of the ICB in September. So that give you what you need on that? Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Any more on the action logs of those items? OK, in that case, let's move on to item five, which is an update from our partnership chief executive, Rob. So over to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Chair. So um, I'll take the paper as read and update you on a number of areas. Uh, because most of the areas, even though we've only just written and published the paper, uh, require an update. That's how much the context is moving at the moment. Uh, so I think it's worth starting with uh, all of the news that's been dominating the media over the last couple of weeks around the Lucy Letby trial and its outcome. Uh, and the consequences of that in the paper uh, were reflected in the calling of an independent inquiry. Since the paper was written that now bowing, I think, to rightly to public pressure, uh, the government has announced it will be a statutory public inquiry led by Lady Justice Thurl. Well, difference is ostensibly that she can compel people to attend and give evidence. So we'll wait and see what happens on the back of that. Uh, but it's useful to note that that's the case. It's also, I think, useful to reinforce that we don't know the outcome of the inquiry. We don't have the lessons learned or fact find, but we do have control over the things that we think are important that we want to reinforce. That's why I wrote to everybody in the ICB immediately about the culture that we have here of speaking up and being heard and it's why, you know, I can see several chief execs and chairs uh, on um, the meetings today who did exactly the same uh, to keep reinforcing that the key thing here is if people have concerns, they're listened to and addressed. And if they don't feel they're being addressed, there are any number of ways in which they can have those concerns addressed and escalate them through their staff side, their staff networks, uh, their whistle blowing arrangements if required and so on. So it's useful for us to keep that in view. Uh, all of the chairs and chief executives on here from the NHS have been invited to attend a meeting tomorrow to discuss further what the collective actions in the NHS might be. So we can give you feedback from that next time. So that's an update on the paper on the Let Be 
uh, trial. Uh, in terms of respiratory illness, you'll see that there's an update on the state of play. Since we wrote the paper, uh, there's been uh, a, an announcement that the government has decided, rightly I think, uh, and that's definitely the view of our public health colleagues, uh, to bring forward the COVID vaccination programme into early September. Uh, now this follows a period of um, toing and froing a little bit, it's worth saying, and some anxieties in the system to do with COVID and flu and movements in the timescales by which people would be vaccinated. What we now have is uh, the requirement for us to start the vaccination programme next week and for that to begin with people in care homes, those at risk, and people at risk are already getting called to book their appointments um, for their COVID vaccinations. The reason is because of this um, the, the, this uh, this variant of potential concern, and there's tr there's a trade off between do you wait and see how serious it is, or do you vaccinate people early? and worry about the risks that that might leave with waning um, with with waning immunity towards the back end of the winter. And the decision was taken nationally through uh, public health advice and others that it should start early. So thank you to everybody in the system, in primary care, in our general practices, primary care networks, in pharmacies uh, and in our places who are standing up the arrangements to make that happen. Uh, because it's a huge undertaking. So that's changed since last time. Um, the next thing that's changed is that we do now have confirmation that the junior doctors uh, voted 98% in favour to continue with their industrial action in their latest ballot on a majority turnout. So the strength of feeling amongst that junior doctors is not waning in terms of their views around what their pay should be in terms of their campaign on, in their views, pay restoration. So the consequences of that are that there are now six more days of strike action in September and October, 20th to the 22nd of September, and the 2nd, 3rd and 4th of October. The big change this time, which is of concern to all of us operationally, is that those actions will be coordinated to be at the same time in the October slots. So in the past we've had consultants covering for junior doctors and uh, we've had junior doctors and consultants around when consultants have been striking. For some of the period we will have emergency cover only. So we'll be working very closely with staff side colleagues um, locally and nationally to make sure that we have safe responsive care the consequences for elective care will be substantial. So that's the position. Uh, the government's position on it, and this is a dispute between the government and the BMA, is that the, the, the pay offer is the last best and final offer. So there is no talks scheduled on pay to resolve the dispute at this point. Um, the next thing that it's worth updating on, obviously, is reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, which we are experts in in West Yorkshire, given the long standing issues that we've known about in Airedale Hospital. Um, Airedale Hospital is part of the new hospitals programme, and for Luke, Andrew, and others are working with the National Hospitals Programme for the reprovision of the hospital. We've been uh, securing the hospital. Uh, with additional capital from the centre for some time and uh, for Lukey and Andrew and their board working with Bradford have got some substantial ongoing monitoring of the building to make sure that it is safe. So we've uh, we've got uh, RAC as an issue that is potentially affecting some of our schools. That's important to us um, because uh, we know that our staff have got children uh, and have childcare issues and anything that disrupts their lives could potentially disrupt services and we have a duty of care and support too. So we'll keep that in view uh, in the coming weeks. Um, in addition to that, we continue to work together on a range of other matters 
which are positive and negative. So going back to maternity for a second, we have a good long-standing mature local maternity system which supports hospitals to work on best practice and mutual support and uh, you'll see in the paper that that local maternity system has been cited as helping support good practice on things like uh, patient voices into maternity services and has been cited in the latest uh, ratings for uh, our hospitals in Leeds and Caldwell and Huddersfield, who've both been rated good for maternity services in a context where that's a pretty difficult thing to achieve. And you'll remember that other CQC ratings have shown improvements in maternity services with still some issues for us to resolve. So that collective working you know, our focus on good organisations in a good system uh, does bring us some substantial benefits. Um, I don't know if the mayor wants to say anything about the good work we're doing together on the Fair Work Charter at this point. Tracy, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Rob. And what an absolute thrill to be here in this partnership. We're going to say a little bit about the partnership agreement, I think, in the next item. But just to the Fair Work Charter, um, we know that um, people can't be well if they're in poor work, poor work that's uh, not paid and they have no agency over their, their hours, they're not respected, they're, um, uh, you know, treated badly by bad employers. So this is why the Fair Work Charter really matters for us. And what it was one of my pledges as men. It's taken us a wee while to get here because we've done a whole sequence of consultation because more than anything, we don't want it to be a charter that just the big businesses can sign up to because they're already doing the right thing. This is for our SMEs and you'll know that 95% uh, plus businesses in West Yorkshire are, are, are small and medium enterprises. So we, need, we needed it to be as attractive to SMEs as possible to say, come in, the water's lovely, rather than beat people with a stick to join us. So it's been really brilliant to, to get their buy-in and support. And we've got a really good cohort so far who have signed up and it's we're gonna have a soft launch um, uh, this autumn. Uh, you know, those early adopters are gonna be really important. But also, if you would like to join us, uh, as part of the Fair Work Charter, please do think um, about, uh, you know, being part of the early phase and get in touch with my office through Rob or however, and we can talk more because good work equals good health. And that's where this partnership is going to be so magical. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. So I think we would all want to sign up to the Fair Work Charter, so we'll find a way of making that happen. Um, and that fits with our work, I think, around how we ensure that local residents can have good work through us as a partnership and our organisation. So Councillor Hinchcliffe and I were sharing yesterday the great work that's going on in Bradford through the Care uh, Academy, looking at how we work together to get uh, young people into the caring professions uh, and that being part of our overall anchor system work um, that fits with our broader ambitions you know i think we need to be pragmatists realists and people who bring hope and we have a specific piece of work we're one of 10 pathfinders on project hope which i don't know if, if jenny or simon wants to say something very briefly about that at this point um, I know this is an agenda item, Rob, for um, oh, yeah. Sorry. later on, so yeah. I'm more than happy to talk about let's, it now or wait until it's the agenda item. Let, 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 let's pick it up later on. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, so um, there isn't anything else I want to draw people's attention to. Uh, you know, you can see the figures around the good progress uh, work we're doing around things like waiting, cancer and so on. I would direct people towards the FAQs on cancer and to anybody who has any queries about those given the headlines around uh, reduction in cancer targets there's some fantastic frequently asked questions that the cancer alliance have put together on that uh, and we continue to look to make sure that people are informed and engaged and involved in all that we do 
Thank, thanks very much, Rob. <coughs> um, you said, um, you know, take your report as read, but I would just emphasise for anybody participating in the meeting or what, watching online, you know, what a what a good and informative read Rob's report is for this, and uh, it always includes links to key documents as well. So it's a, a pretty comprehensive overview of what's uh, what's happening that's affecting us across the whole system in West Yorkshire. So thank you, Rob. Um, Hand, thank you. Um, thank you as always, Rob, for your report. As Councillor Swift said, it's always really informative and comprehensive. Having raised the issue of paying care staff the real living wage a couple of times in these meetings, I'm really, really delighted to hear um, about the work that we're doing with Tracy's team around um, an ethical work charter as well. I just wanted to raise an issue that is referred to in your report, um, which is around finance. And I wanted to talk about um, the state of council finances at the moment, which I, again, I've raised previously in meetings and I know it is on risk registers as um, a really big challenge facing us, but obviously you would all have seen in the news that Birmingham has put in a 114 notice so that that really emphasizes the desperate state we're in that council's going bankrupt is an absolute present reality um i mentioned in an earlier meeting that the figure of 25 million that's quoted in rob's report i do really appreciate that's not the whole of the money that has to be found but that figure you know is less than some councils have as current in their deficits or and or lower than the amount that we've got to find in the next financial year and financial years after that and this isn't the first time we're having to do this either we're in our 13th year of cuts really significant cuts to our budgets and having to make really huge savings um a couple of times in pr previous meetings earlier today the word efficiency has been used and just to be really clear, we're not making efficiencies in councils, we're making really huge, horrible cuts. And we are in the process of having to make decisions about what we cut next. And we are having to make cuts to social care budgets, which we have protected absolutely fiercely as Labour councils in West Yorkshire. And they will still be protected. Adults and children's social care will still be protected in our councils. However, even with other directorates taking a bigger hit, we are having to cut into health and social care budgets now because we have nowhere else to go. I raised this earlier in our development session under the section about mutual accountability because I feel this is probably the biggest threat to our relationships in terms of, you know, decisions that we make in councils to cut social care, which we have to make, which we do not want to make, I would say, with all my heart, um, those decisions are going to impact on the whole system if we make cuts to social care. And that's the reality we're in at the moment. The final point I wanted to make on um, council finances, and this is really knowing, Rob, that you have some kind of national influence and other people on the call do as well. The really biggest, the biggest threat to us as councils and, you know, where we're all hemorrhaging money and this is national, not only local, is in children's social care. We are losing so much money to external residential placements, all of us. And um, there's a number of reasons for that. There's the huge increase in the number of children coming into care, which I think is widely recognised as being very driven by poverty and increasing complexity. We've got more adolescents coming into care with complex needs who are survivors of trauma, and that's where we're spending money on external residential placements. And then you've got the obscenity of the profiteering in the private sector, which a number of us are campaigning on. I've done some work on this nationally because I sit on the Children and Young People's Board for the Local Government Association, which is a national cross-party board, as do other people in the region. So I just wanted to make that point, really, that we are in a really desperate financial state. And I think I think we need more than ever to be committed to our relational, restorative, collaborative way of working. But there's no escaping the fact that we are going to have to make cuts in councils in social care that will impact on the health and care system. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, Kathy? Thank you. Um, to support uh, what uh, Fiona is just saying, particularly in the private development session we've had today and in previous discussions, we want to look at risks across our partnership, uh, but also build on the strengths that we have. So as a system, we have a good open book approach to our finances. Uh, we can see the reporting by provider, by place, for example, in the NHS. And I wonder, Fiona, perhaps what we can build on that works well from our five, six year partnership, or perhaps what needs to change, improve, adapt because of this financial year going forward. And we talked earlier in our in our session about the consequence of decision making, respecting that, but everyone having foresight on it. And, and Fiona, you've been so open and passionate at the same time. Um, uh, about that and I wonder what our community of finance directors may want to do, what place committees may want to do and for us within the ICB we, we have uh, oversight of this uh, particularly on the NHS side. Um, it, are there briefing papers, is there adaption of practice so uh, I throw it out there that I think there's some good things working but I think we've got to develop or change our practice from this year onwards. Thanks very much, Kathy. Agreed. Um, Liz, yeah, Liz Mayer. Uh, thanks, Councillor Swift. And just building on what Councillor Venner said and, and Kathy, uh, in, in Kirklees, through the Place Based Committee, we've put in a quarterly meeting with the Council to uh, have an early warning system about what they might be considering cutting to see if we can work together to, we, we know it will probably have to happen, but can we minimise some of the impacts across the partnership? So we have the next one in a couple of weeks. And as you know, our council's changed. Um, so it's probably a good opportunity for us to sit down and really understand the situation and uh, think about how we try and mitigate some of the cuts that are going to have to be made if if we can. So it might be a model we could use to, to for other place-based committees as well. Thanks, Liz. That's really interesting. Perhaps we can we can pick that back up at the um, the regular chairs and yes. uh, wellbeing board and leaders meetings we have. Rob. So I do think that this is about us being really clear about how we're working together this year and beyond. And um, Jonathan Webb, the director of finance for the partnership is working with colleagues on a long-term financial model we can sort of be bashed around but coming out of a period of six monthly allocations for the nhs to annual and maybe more longer term allocations we can start to plan into the medium term and we should do that together and then what we must do i think through place committees is do the planning for next year together and we need to start that soon uh, you know, as NHS bodies, we could wait for the planning guidance to come out. It tends to come out Christmas Eve as a as a late Christmas present or early in January. That's too late. We need to recognise that we probably know about how much money we're going to get. We probably know what sort of priorities we'll have. Probably going to shift very much from the central ones and we've agreed our local ones. So let's get into a meaningful dialogue in places about what we're planning to do next year. And let's use the place committees to do that. So what I would suggest is that if we can get um, a combination of people together to map that out uh, and bring that back as a process, that would be a good thing to do. I think on to uh, Councillor Venner's points about children. Simon has put in the chat, if people can't see it, that I met with the directors of children's services collectively recently and we agreed that this should be a priority piece of work uh, children going into care and how we turn the curve on that based on previous good practice and anything that we can collectively do together uh, there's a session in october that brings together the dcs's with a group of people from the children's program to look into that work but we should bring that back again as a priority here i think given the concerns that we have about cost and quality Thanks, Rob. Uh, Kim? And thanks, Chair. I just want to uh, link um, Council, I was going to say Fiona, <laughs> Councillor Venner's uh, point about the local authority cuts um, and the impact on the VCSE because we are already seeing that coming through. So, you know, we're all very committed to um, our agenda on early help and prevention. We know that. Um, the bite of poverty um, across our communities is significant. Um, so we're seeing the 
the effect of those cuts play out now, particularly for some of our grassroots organisations, um, recognising pragmatically that some of that um, is unavoidable. So just wanted to revisit that we have signed up to, as part of that anti-poverty work, seven principles, which aren't necessarily about um, finance. It's about ways of working and communicating with the sector, the way in which we're having those early conversations and contracting in the terms in which we're doing that. Um, so I just wanted to use it as an opportunity to flag those and I'll post those in the chat as well, just to remind people. Thank you, Kim. Um, Fiona, you want to come back? A totally different question. So, I do, if anyone else wants to come in on finance stuff, I can wait. I'm not seeing anyone else. Okay. So, no. um, I don't know, Rob, if you'll be able to answer this or if anyone on the call will be, because I don't know if anyone's operationally close enough to the front line work, but I just wondered if you knew what support was being provided to neonatal nurses and doctors in the light of the Lucy Letby murder trial, because I imagine they've been more shaken than anybody else and also they may well be dealing with fear and anxiety from parents that they're supporting. So I just wondered if you knew what what support's been provided. Thank you. So there's support being offered in all of the organisations that uh, are affected. And I don't know, Mel, you, you might want to, I mean, we were talking about the sort of support that you're offering in Bradford, for example, and for Luke and others that I can see on the screen will be directly doing this. So I don't know, Mel, if you want to share what we were discussing the other day. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Rob, uh, Chab. We, um, so immediately the, uh, following the verdict over that weekend, um, uh, one of our, we always have an exec on call over the weekend. So they dropped in and had a bit of a chat with the uh, staff on the neonatal unit. I followed that up on the the Monday morning. Then we arranged um, a, a bigger conversation with our medical senior nursing leads and uh, general managers of the unit. And in essence, we were, you know, we were inevitably the questions will be asked uh, of all organisations. Could this happen here? So we were really upfront about that question you know do you think this could happen here why do you think it, it it may or it may not what safeguards do we have how do you feel supported do you think you could speak up if you saw something that was on one level the second level is as you've alluded to are you picking up an, an additional amount of anxiety from the families and the parents that you are caring whose babies you are caring for right now is there chatter is there um a, a, a heightened degree of observation is there a reluctance for the parents to leave their babies in your care so we explored all of these things it was about a two-hour conversation actually um and i took some uh, assurance from what they were telling me about how they felt supported i also offered to put in place some additional uh, access to our uh, occupational health psychology services. Um, we agreed that we would put um, communications into the neonatal unit for surgeries, if you like, for staff uh, or uh, families to come and discuss any issues around um, specifics of the, the, the care being provided to their babies or, or just general uh, curiosities and questions and anxieties given rise to by the outcome of the case. Um, and we've continued to have that dialogue throughout. And as Rob says, I, I and others, many of my colleagues will be in London tomorrow for a conversation about um, what happens next. And in addition to that, at a very, at the highest level in the organisations, of course, we're having these conversations about what are our arrangements for freedom to speak up, um, fit and proper person um, and, and anything else that comes along as a consequence of tomorrow's or subsequent uh, conversations and indeed the inquiry. Thanks, Mark. I can see Brendan and Baluke, uh, and like yourself, also clinically qualified chief executives. Um, 
don't know if Brendan or Luke here want to say anything about what's been what they've been doing. Uh, uh, thanks, Rob. I'm sorry. I was just I, I've, I've had an urgent call. Um, so I, I didn't quite get the question. But in response to what are we doing, I, I think some of this is also, um, as Mel described, assuring our colleagues and our patients um, about our responses to them speaking up to any concerns. Um, I, th I think within all of this, there is a debate about a healthcare who has been charged with being a serial killer. If I put that to one side, this speaks to me about how do teams escalate concerns and what do they do if they can if they feel that their concerns aren't being appropriately heard. I think the other thing for me is is about how our colleagues may speak to our police uh, colleagues if there are concerns that are beyond the pale. Um, so you know, I I, I personally. I'm in this for the long haul rather than an immediate response to some of the media attention that's taking place. Um, it'd be interesting to see how tomorrow plays out. I know there's, there's as you've said in your report, Rob, debate about whether managers or executives should be regulated, but I'm much more interested in how we get to the point of people feeling that their concerns are being appropriately heard and indeed acted on. Thank you. Cathy? Thank you. I, I think I, I wonder so, if a, sorry, I think I actually saw Faluki about to open a mouth then. <laughs> yeah, just just to add to what colleagues have said, I mean, we've taken a pretty much a similar approach. I think the other bit I would add is that I've encouraged our colleagues, in addition to making sure that they understand how to raise concern, is about how do we ensure we have an open and transparent approach, which means none of us are beyond reproach, and therefore where an accusation might be made that we are open and willing to uh, participate in the inquiry that follows as part of understanding what might have led to a particular perception so we can clear up sooner rather than later where actually there might be a misunderstanding or indeed where there are serious concerns that the safety actions are taken sooner. So it's a two-way process for me. It's not just about raising concerns. It's also about if somebody raised a concern about me, how do I react? And I'm open about how we do that because I think that's a leadership challenge in this as well. Thank you. Okay, Cathy. Thank you. Um, I wonder for colleagues not in the NHS whether it might be helpful that we do a one page or an email briefing just on what already exists. It's for Luki's point about um, uh, how you even challenge incredibly senior managers, how we have long standing maternity safety champion, executive and non executive remits on boards, freedom to speak up champion roles, senior independent directors. This isn't the NHS and bureaucracy, this is about creating really good tension within a governance arrangement on, on a board, particularly when uh, there are issues such as this. Um, and so maybe we could do that uh, as a follow up and positive things we're doing, such as the Maternity Voices um, a group that we have where we listen to uh, women and uh, their carers about their experiences and bring them together with midwives and doctors as well. So uh, as well as uh, what colleagues have shared now on how there's a specific oversight and preparation for an inquiry. Thanks very much, Cathy. That would, that would be helpful. Uh, Brandon? I, I think the only other thing I'd say, I'm sorry I'm, I'm late to the conversation, is we do need to think about our leaders and our managers in all of this who are in a particularly difficult space due to the, the media scrutiny that's playing out here. Um, and it isn't just about the here and now. I think going back to the long haul comment, there's something about future proofing. Some of the arrangements that both Faluki, uh, Mel and Cathy have described, but equally, how do we care for and support our future managers and leaders and those that we currently have in post who are going through it? This is a difficult experience for everybody. Thanks, Brendan. Okay, thank you very much. That was that that, that was really valuable. Um, and if there are no more questions on any items of Rob's report, people are okay. Then let's move on to. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Yes. Sorry, Tim. I just That's wondered okay. if anyone wanted to know more about winter planning. I think I I just wanted to reflect and say, Rob, thank you for sharing an update there. Uh, we have had oversight of winter planning for many months, including learning um, a learning document to the ICB board back in March. So, uh, and Rob's talked about uh, immunisations, for example, uh, work uh, with chief operating officers across our system, particularly in acute services. But I don't know if anyone's got any more questions or 
And Rob, I'm not setting you up for more work, but we're about to enter winter. There's a huge amount of work, a huge amount yeah. of scrutiny, a huge amount of checklists. Most people on this call are filling, I filled them all in. Some yeah. people on the call are accountable for making sure they get delivered. Uh, it feels like we're in a reasonable place in terms of what we need to do. Um, we will we we will and have learned from last year and some of the signs are encouraging from the southern hemisphere around things like flu uh, but we've also got things like you know variants which may cause us more problems so i i wouldn't necessarily um i'm very happy to answer questions as will others um Okay. Thanks, Rob. I just wouldn't even want the meeting to pass without yeah. noting that you've highlighted it in your report. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's that's important and appreciated. And yeah, uh, yeah most of us through our places will have some uh, some awareness of the amount of work that's going going on to prepare. OK, thank you. Um, right. I will move us on then to item six, which is the partnership agreement. If I can ask. Um, Ian and Rachel to briefly introduce this item and then I'll bring Tracy in to comment on it here. Uh, Ian? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Swift. So um, you remember that our last meeting in June, um, we introduced the, the idea of having a partnership agreement between the West Yorkshire ICB and the combined authority. And we shared a draft of that document um, and it really it attempts to sort of codify and, and formalise slightly the, the positive working relationships that we've had with um, the com combined authority over a number of years. Um, at the meeting in June, there was quite um, strong support um, for the concept of a partnership agreement, as well as some suggestions about what might be included. Um, so just as a reminder, that the, the, the partnership agreement covers three broad areas, really. So first, it talks about shared mission and priorities. Um, you know, the Fair Work Charter that we discussed earlier is a really good example of that. There's a, there's a, there's a really important shared space between the work that we do as an ICB and, and the work that the combined authority do. Um, we, and we want to work together more closely on those things. Um, the second is around shared capacity. Um, and I can see that Jen Connolly, Rachel Loftus and Fatma Khan Shah are all on this call and they are um, three quarters of that shared capacity, which is excellent. Um, and then the third part of it's around shared kind of ways of working and governance arrangements. And um, the reason why Mayor Braben and, and Ben Stiller are on this call is because we've agreed that we will um, they will be included in our partnership board um, going forward and there'll be reciprocal arrangements into the WICA um, uh, governance arrangements. Um, so we think we've got a final document now. It's got the relevant signatures on um, and we want to, to bring it back almost just kind of formalise and finalise this piece of work and um, you know get partnership board endorsement of the final document. Uh, Rachel, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add before we bring Mayor Braben in. No, I would say it's probably just um, it's another example of how we want to be mutually accountable um, about the, about we know that um, people's lives will be improved by all of the factors that impact on them. And that working together is really part of that. And but also the other part of that is about how we speak up for the people of West Yorkshire um, and their needs through these types of arrangements. And it'll give us that um, additional ability to share our joint and collective voices and to advocate for the people of West Yorkshire through these arrangements. Thank you. Tracy, I bring you in. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to colleagues on this call for enabling us to get this partnership agreement over the line, what feels quite swiftly. Um, you will know that as mayor, uh, whilst I'm the police and crime commissioner, so I have responsibilities to hold the chief constable to account, which gives me a great opportunity to look at like a Venn diagram of how my responsibilities in, in housing and in skills and transport can also help when it comes to uh, early intervention and prevention and safety of women and girls, for example. I didn't have that same relationship in health. Um, and we know, as we've heard from Councillor Venner, that poverty is expensive, but I can help, hopefully, in this partnership, help you and your colleagues to bring down the, the pressures that you are facing by making sure that people are have better health 
whether that's through better housing, better opportunities for work um, and uh, making sure they can get around to college and uh, to um, to doctor's appointments and so on by increasing investment in transport, uh, building mass transit and so on. So I do think this is a really brilliant moment. And I know that other NCAs around the country are very jealous that we've managed to get this over the line because they are as aware as I am that we have 80% of the things that generate and sustain good health are out things outside of healthcare. Um, and I think where people are born, where they grow, where they live, uh, where they work and how they age has a massive impact on the health of the population. And we know good health means that you can have an enjoyable and productive life. And really, uh, and it's it's a, it's bold, but it's also about our economic argument. If we're going to grow our economy, then we need to make sure there are more people able to work and to have a fulfilling life and to get on and their kids can have a good life as well. And also, um, I'd like to thank specifically Fatima Khan Shah, who has become my inclusivity champion. And she's also part of the bridge between um, the ICB and uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And also, you'll um, be aware of the great work already uh, undergo that we're undertaking with the Violence Reduction Partnership and the system of sanctuary that you're also part of. But this is about the climate emergency. It's about inclusivity and diversity and inclusive economy. And that's, um, you know, it's, a, I think, a really exciting moment for us here in West Yorkshire. And so I'm really pleased that there's reciprocity, that I'm privileged to be um, able to come to your board, but also that Cathy will join the uh, Combined Authorities Place and Regeneration Committee, recognising the important part Part that the NHS plays in our local economy is strengthening local um, our, our close working relationship for the benefit of our residents. So this is just the beginning. I hope to really get to know uh, more of you and Jen and colleagues. You've already made such an impact in our organisation. So thank you. Um, so really happy to hear from you, your thoughts, your ideas. You know, poverty costs us all. It's too expensive. We can intervene from a mayoral point of view to help you and of course you can help me uh, enable I have a, a healthy workforce as well uh, to get to get back into work and so on so there's lots we can do together I'm really excited about the future thank you ever so much and thanks so much Tim thanks very much Tracy we had a good discussion about this at the last meeting as well uh, any 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 further further comments on the partnership agreement and the issues raised at this point I think it's always been a strength of this health, you know, the, the the integrated system in in West Yorkshire that we've recognised those wider connections and and seen that mutual dependence between, um, you, you know, between the, the the economy and the health and the health system, and of course also health and care is potentially a huge driver in terms of economic change as well, just as a major major employer and um, a major major investor, and there are things we want to build on and maximise there too. Um, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Mayor Rabin. I think the um, so just three things that uh, we need. To, sorry, if I oh, okay, sorry, I froze for a second there. Um, so really welcome this partnership. I think it's got potential to make a huge difference to people. Um, the point that Councillor Swift was just making there about our contribution to the economy and seeing it as an investment rather than a cost in terms of health and care is one of the big shifts that we have to get in mindset, I think, nationally and locally. Uh, the NHS Confederation produced a briefing uh, with Carnell Farrer recently that said for every pound you invest in primary and community services, you get a £14 return for the uh, health of the public. Uh, so this sort of connection between poverty and employment, just through the 100,000 staff we employ and also through the med tech work we're doing um, in in the Leeds City region is a big part of what we, what we should all be thinking about. The other two things I wanted to pitch were our creative health work and you know your new deal for the creative economies. We've got to make sure that we maximise that in the Leeds 
city of culture, uh, the Bradford city of culture, you know, the Wakefield um, year of uh, it's Kirkley's year of music, isn't it? Wakefield uh, annual year and then Culturedale next year, huge opportunities there. And finally, uh, the work that we're doing on violence, you know, on violence with the violence reduction unit around adversity, trauma and resilience is world leading. Genuinely, we hear a lot of hyperbole about this sort of stuff. Uh, Ian Lammy from uh, the science, Chief Scientific Advisor to the New Zealand Government was here last week visiting West Yorkshire to see the work that we do on adversity, trauma and resilience and being a trauma informed system because he'd heard about what we're doing in Singapore and needed to come and visit. And Warren Larkin, who's an international consultant, says he uses us as the case study to follow. So I know we've we've making progress in that space. We haven't made sufficient progress, but when people from other systems and other countries come and have a look, uh, they always reflect back how much work we are doing, how well it's going, and that we should keep pushing that. So I know that fits, uh, Mayor, with your approach to violence against women and girls and the VRU. So we, we really genuinely need to keep pushing that. Thank you. Tracy? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Rob. And honestly, this does feel like just the beginning. Um, but to, to, to the point about the international reputation, um, I was able uh, last year to go to Arab Health to represent West Yorkshire businesses in health tech. And I think hopefully I can also be an ambassador for the work that we're doing together. So please do tell me of things that you want to, me to amplify um, because we can make that case, as I am doing with West Yorkshire Police, that we are uh, unique and we are open for innovation. We are changing the game um, uh, and we are ready to be creative problem solvers. So, um, you know, I I'm excited to hear that about the impact that the work you're having is resonating across the world. And certainly we can do much more of that. Thank you very much. So, uh, Cathy? Yeah. Um, just wanted to reiterate in terms of sharing practice and, um, and sharing our experience, we are part of a national forum through NHS Confederation around the fourth purpose of an integrated care system around the NHS's contribution to the broader economic and social development. So I'm pleased that Jen Connolly is part of that within her dual role, which entirely complements the agreement that we're signing off today, um, uh, as well as the work that we've done for many, many years together. Uh, and I think, Tracy, we've, we've had these discussions before. The NHS really hasn't stepped into, overall, traditionally, the NHS hasn't stepped into this world before. But we've, because we're ahead, I, I'm really pleased that this agreement then supports what's gone before and what we can do next. And I'm pleased to join your committee uh, as well, because that's that's really going to bring health into the heart of planning as well. So I just want to take him forward, Tim, whether we pick up these moments of best practice within our system, as well as how we benchmark ourselves across uh, uh, with other systems, such as Greater Manchester, who's also uh, they're part of this national forum. I think there'll be some learning in going ahead, also linked to the Pink People uh, Board update as well that we're going to have later. So uh, I'm really pleased that we're signing off this agreement today, but there's more to do. And some of this is really familiar to us and some of it we're going to learn along the way, I think is one of the points I wanted to make, but that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, everybody, for contributions on that. And um, we're happy to note the the agreement has been signed and well, and to endorse it. Thank you. Item seven: um, Patient and Public Voice Project Home. Some uh, Project Hope. Apologies. So I'm I'm pleased to welcome for this item Hannah Kirkbride, who's the founder and chief executive of Career Matters, and Jenny Lingrell and Saima Merza to introduce this item and um, over to you Jenny. Thank you Chair, um, so I'm Jenny Lingrell, I'm the Service Director for Children's Health and Wellbeing in Wakefield but also the Joint SRO for the Children and People and Families Programme um, but as Councillor Swift has said the main focus of this agenda item is to hear from Hannah Kirkbride um, who's the CEO of Career Matters um, and one of the key partners for Project HOPE. I just want to set a little bit of the context for Project Hope and all the work that we're doing. Um, 
Project Hope is a significant initiative for West Yorkshire that we're really proud to be delivering from the Children and People's Programme. Um, it completely aligns with our ambition to address the inequality gap for children living in the households with the lowest incomes. And we've already heard today about how important that is um, for the whole of West Yorkshire. Um, what what when we're thinking about our work to reduce um, health inequalities um, working with children and people who are care experienced is a very important area for us to focus in and Hannah is going to talk to us about some of her own experiences and how that's informed the work that she's leading um, what Project Hope is um, is um, a programme of work that means that we can build on our existing practice to support care experienced young people um, to access the workforce and have that rich experience within a health and care workshop. I think Rob said earlier that we're one of only 10 such schemes in the country, so really proud to do that. And it enables us to build on existing experience, um, not least the work that we're doing to become a trauma informed system. And all the work that we're doing in relation to Project Hope is absolutely built on those foundations of everything we've done to become a trauma informed system. And we'll build and grow on that and make it real for the young people who are going to experience um, the benefits of this programme through Project Hope. Um, there are five deliverables um, as part of Project Hope, so I'll just tell you what those are before I hand over to Hannah. Um, but what we will deliver is an opportunity for children and people who are care experienced to have a six month paid placement within health and social care. Alongside that, they'll receive pastoral support, so one to one um mentoring, access to a peer support network um, and training to help them um, benefit from that placement as much as is possible. Um, alongside that, the kind of holistic support around um, access to other sport, leisure, cultural activities that exist within West Yorkshire and alongside that work to um, support them with um, broadening their interests but also developing education and training that is specific to the work that they'll, they'll be doing within our system. So it's a very holistic programme, it's very much um, targeted to address health inequalities with some of our most vulnerable children and young people. Um, Simon's already referenced the work that we're doing jointly with our directors of children's services across West Yorkshire. And as you can imagine, this is a programme that they're very, very keen to collaborate with us on. And we're really pleased to be delivering it as a partnership. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah and she's going to share some of her own experiences and why that's so valuable in helping us to design the programme. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> please bear with me. I'm actually recovering from quite a bad cold, so hopefully my chest will hold out for this. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and to speak with you. One is a professional who works with thousands of care experience young people, adults um, and people with care experience across the country, but also as somebody who went through the care system um, myself. So, um, I work, I'm a director at Career Matters, which is a social enterprise um, that works with people with lived experience across the country. Our two key focuses are people with care experience and or those with criminal justice experience. Um, as you will likely know, and I'll go through some stats shortly, care experience people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. So I just wanted to run through some statistics about why it's so important that we improve job and health outcomes for this community. Um, there is a disconnect between available jobs and care experienced people accessing them. Uh, NEAT figures are national, nationally stand at 41% for 19 to 21 year olds compared to the national average of 11.6%. There's a huge discrepancy. Um, only 17% gain uh, GCSEs. 12% now go on to university and only 2% go into apprenticeships um, and really, really worryingly, 12% of children who've been in care uh, that our local authorities and corporate parents don't know where those young people are. 
Um, these are very vulnerable young people and um, as an organisation we do a lot of work with engaging with them, many of them ending up not recognised in the custodial system. Um, and really worryingly, 70% um, of people who go through the care system will die younger than the rest of the population. So the health inequalities for this community are huge. Um, and we know that 46% of the young people in the youth justice system are in, have been in care, and that a third of the adult prison population are also care experienced. Um, their health inequalities, lack of access to education due to multiple moves, and significant adverse childhood experiences uh, present a whole remit of uh, complexities for people to be able to progress into fulfilling healthy futures. And this project is a critical factor in enabling that. So it's an absolute privilege to be involved and to be able to support you in any way that I can. Um, I do talk about the career prospects and the barriers for people with care experience in more detail. Um, I will share a link um, to a talk that we did about that too. Um, and really, um, as somebody who went through the care system, um, I didn't get uh, career guidance intervention support. I missed huge chunks of my education. I got a criminal record. Um, I faced significant, significant barriers, one, going to university, and two, getting my foot through the door into employment. And I left care a long time ago. And sadly, um, those outcomes and those challenges have not improved greatly. Um, so I just want to encourage people to really get behind Project Hope. Um, and, you know, if you've got jobs and opportunity, uh, connect in with them. Um, we deliver a wider project called the Lived Experience Charter, which can also help employers if they feel unsure how to support people in a trauma informed, open and inclusive way. Um, so I hope that is enough um, and answers and, and you know, kind of underscores all those key areas that uh, care experienced people face. I don't know if anybody's got any questions or any further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Councillor Swift, if I could just wrap up just a little bit about the progress of the project, then we'll invite questions in, if that's OK. Yes. Um, thank you, Jenny and Hannah. really appreciate those um, overviews. My name is Taima Mirza. I'm the Associate Director for Children and Young People for West Yorkshire ICB. Um, and I was just listening to the beginning part of the meeting, and I think Project Hope just talks to all those points about integrated working. And there's so many opportunities here for us to join that, um, you know, when we look at the lens of the wider determinants of health, and uh, Amir talked about how important not just health, but education, employment, housing and travel is to the lives of our communities. And Project Hope aims to try and touch and improve those uh, elements of a, a young person's life. Um, just in terms of progress against those five deliverables that Jenny mentioned before, you'll have seen hopefully through comms because we've been trying to get the comms out as much as possible. We launched our expression of interest for some placement uh, invites couple of weeks ago now, the, the um, expression of interest closes on the 18th of September. So if you could please promote that within your teams, uh, we're looking for paid placements that give these young people an opportunity to gain those skills in employment. Um, I really want to thank the Mayor's Office and Wiker and Fatima and Jen Connolly because they've given us an offer of free travel cards for these young people that will come on to Project Up. So it's a fantastic opportunity for again us to do that integrated working and support these young people. But also linked in as well as with Hannah's organisation, but also with Prince's Trust. And the Prince's Trust have said that they're going to support us with that pastoral wraparound offer, uh, which is really important, particularly when they're talking about offering workshops for these young people around CV writing and interview prep. They're even talking about giving them laptops and Wi-Fi access and um, money to buy interview clothes. So it's a, a, a really wholesome offer, which is fantastic to be part of. And I really hope we can change some lives here. And that's what we're about reducing those inequalities so I'll, I'll leave it there but again as Hannah and Jenny have said happy to take any questions thank you thank you um so uh, I've got um Fiona Councillor Vanna thank you chair um I just wanted to make a comment really thank you that was really inspiring and I very much enjoyed reading the report I'm the Cabinet Member for Children's Social Care at Leeds and I chair our Corporate Parenting Board and I have to say 
um, working with looked after children and foster families is probably my favourite part of my portfolio. And I found I found I did find your report very inspiring. And I think one of the one of the things we've started to think about because one of the areas of corporate parenting I've been really keen to develop is that corporate parenting is the whole council. It's not only children's social care and that the the children that we look after are, are all our children. And within that, we've been working on developing the concept of the council being the family firm because actually it's a, we're a massive employer with so many different departments and so many opportunities and we need to be making more use of that with regard to our children who are looked after in our care leaves and just like a really simple example but I did think this sort of epitomizes the family firm and the sort of favours you would call it might call in for your kids or your friends kids I visited one of our children's homes recently and one of the young men who lived there was gardening when I got there and we ended up having quite a long conversation about gardening um, and I said to him why why don't we see if we can get you some work experience in one of the council's parks you know we've got we've got so many gardeners and so many green spaces and you know all our senior managers in parks started as apprentice gardeners it's a really good possible career path and I thought that was just a really really quick example of just having that mindset that we are the family firm and we provide loads of opportunities and of course many people who've been brought up by council may well not want to work for that council when they're adults they might want to do something completely different but in terms of opportunities for work experience and voluntary work and then possibly careers if people want to work for the council, we do, we do have a lot of opportunities. I'm really proud to say as well, as I'm sure other councils on this call will as well, we've got a number of social workers that are care experienced as well that have chosen to come back into um, not necessarily the council they were brought up in, but, you know, I've chosen to bring that lived experience back into our council. The other thing we're looking at doing is we're joining the list of the councils that have... Um, have pledged to make being care experience a protected characteristic. So we're just looking, obviously that's a big national campaign run by a care leaver. And we're looking at what the implications of that are. And we're particularly looking at what the implications are from an employment perspective. And that's the area our care leavers are quite keen for us to look at as well. So I think that's another way that councils in particular can get on board with this agenda is by joining that campaign and passing that resolution. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Fiona. I echo many of those things from um, Parallels, what we're, we're doing, similar things in Calderdale as well, and I know other other local authority colleagues will be. Um, Fatima. Oh, wow, I feel quite emotional, actually. Um, this is exactly why I come into work every single day. And I remember, Simon, when we first started this conversation, as I concepted, it seems so hard just to see it get here and the momentum and energy behind it is just just incredible. Um, and a huge thank you to you and to Jenny and to Tim for championing this because it hasn't been easy and the support you've had has just been incredible. Um, a couple of comments and, and offers of help, I suppose. The, the first one is, um, this is a demonstrable example of how we are trying to finesse our approach to inclusion to be much more sophisticated. So we're not looking at just children and young people. We're looking at children and young people that are impacted disproportionately in a socioeconomic way. And I think one of the things that we could potentially look at as well is the relationship we now have with WICA that has just been signed off and the ink isn't even dry yet with its work with the private sector and the amazing influence of our mayor with the private sector leaders and um, with big employers across the region to really get this the kudos it deserves. So there's an offer from me about how we can connect you in with that. And I suppose my other question is about the charter and about how we can really amplify this, particularly in my work as uh, inclusion champion, to make sure that everybody considers this charter because Hannah's story is incredible and the charter should therefore be a legacy that no other child should experience the same so if there are things we can do to support you with that i would you know love to do so but i think this is absolutely incredible and everyone on the ship calls should support it well done to all of you thank you rob yeah so building on i don't know fatima likes likes work and uh i just wondered if there's a way of if everybody believes that in principle, we should sign up to the fact that being a care leaver is a protected characteristic that we ask Fatima to make that reality as a joint appointment between us 
all. Um, that would be that would be a breakthrough, I think, because then we'd have to everybody would have to take it into account. And I think just to Council of Venner's point, which is really well made, don't forget that there are three hundred different roles in the NHS. Uh, you know, you can be a graphic designer, you can be a gardener. If I can see Shubu on the call, uh, you know, nothing better than walking through the gardens at Fieldhead, that which are incredible, and the woodland, which is all maintained by internal staff. You know, there, there's 300 different jobs, so we, we've all got opportunities, I think, to provide op options for people, and we're all struggling to get folk. So having people from who are care leavers in our system uh, maybe a benefit to them and to us. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and I endorse that. If, if Fatima's got any capacity to share some of that information and work that's being done on on the, because um, we're looking at the protected characteristic thing as well, and uh, I suspect the same legal and HR questions are being raised about it in every authority. So if we can get a definitive and shared answer, that will make life much easier. Thank you very much. So I'm 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 pretty clear from this. We want to endorse this work enthusiastically. But I don't know if Jenny or Hannah, is there anything you want to come back on before we finish? You're very welcome. Uh, only to thank everyone for all their support. It's it's brilliant, and that's what will make this a success if it becomes a whole system um, approach. So very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you again, uh, Hannah, for your contribution and sharing your experience with us. It's really appreciated. Thank you. So, um, item eight, West Yorkshire People Board update. And I think I'll ask Kate to introduce us, please. So, thank you, Councillor um, Swift. Um, and just to say hello to everybody, I think I've probably met nearly everybody on the call. I'm Kate Sims, I'm the Director of People for the ICB. Um, apologies, I wasn't able to join the development session, but I've really enjoyed the discussion at this second meeting. Um, I think what's really evident is the conversations have all come back to the importance of our workforce and our opportunities across our workforce to to, to really uh, improve things uh, for, for the whole of the West Yorkshire um, population. So it's really great to hear that. Um, many of you will have heard um, regular updates on aspects of the people plan, the West Yorkshire people plan across the partnership board. But, but quite rightly, um, Rob, as, as my line manager has, has said, it'd be really useful to receive on a regular basis an update from the West Yorkshire People Board through to this committee. J just for clarification, for those who are new to this, the, the People Board reports through to this partnership board as opposed to the, the ICB board. So uh, it really does reflect that the membership and there's a huge um, and, and broad membership across this. So this is the first of, of those reports. A again, a bit like um, Rob said, suggested earlier, I, I will assume that you have read it. Hopefully it was useful to give you a flavour of the um, sort of really live agenda across the people plan. And um, there are links to the people plan for anybody who, who isn't familiar. And what we've actually done over certainly the last 12 months or so is there are five key areas, key pillars or themes of the people plan which are listed in the report. And because the people agenda, as you've probably picked up today, is so broad, we actually focus each meeting on, on two themes. Um, and, and what that really allows us to do is from a system wide perspective in terms of some of the work that my own team um, might be leading on. But more importantly, as or as importantly, I think from all of our places and our sectors, it gives us a real opportunity to, to dive quite deeply, hopefully, in, into some of the themes that we are, are working working on. I won't take you through obviously, obviously every piece of the paper because hopefully it's self-explanatory, but I think there's, there's one or two pieces which I think are particularly relevant. Um, I think one of the items that I provided a short update at the last meeting was around the living wage review. And, and certainly I know Councillor Venner have, have, have um, obviously listened with interest that today. You, you raised this as quite correctly, I think, as, as a challenge when we were discussing the, uh, the, the wider West Yorkshire strategy and particularly whether we were being ambitious enough, I think, was the challenge in relation to, to this. And um, the ask, I think, from, from the last partnership board was that we would set up through the people board a, a task and finish group. That has now been established. We started our first meeting on the 30th of July. And yes, I chair it, but I think the important thing is to thank all, all the colleagues. It's a relatively tight group because obviously we're trying to... Um, 
do as it suggests, task and finish. You know, we've got to really keep the scope quite tight, but we do have great representation. Um, I can see many of the people who are on the screen. Rachel um, Loftus, thank you. You've been really instrumental in helping with some of this work. We've got really great representation from our care associations, from our voluntary sectors, and um, our hospice collaboration. And really the purpose I think you've, you've challenged us or you've tasked us with is, is firstly to identify the current position across West Yorkshire around the living wage agenda. So, so where have we got organisations who, who are currently not able to meet that 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 as a, as a first standard and we do recognize that we could have greater ambitions beyond that and then i think a conversation for a future um meeting chair is is to discuss what's our propositions as, as, as a partnership across west yorkshire and, and do we have both the ambition but also the ability to, to start to really close some of those gaps I would like to say, and you'll hear a lot more detail from us when we, we aim to come to the December meeting with, with a more detailed presentation, that we recognise that that is only one aspect um, and, and really great to hear, obviously, the link to the Fair Work Charter today. There's, there's, there's so many aspects of scope that we could take forward, but that that's that first one. So the actual people board, um, we, we had two themes um, at the last meeting, the first of which was looking after our people. Um, and just to, to clarify, we had a, a great presentation from colleagues from our Kirklees and Calderdale places. They have an established workforce steering group. I, I can see Brendan's on the call, who I know uh, ch chairs that group, but he would be the first to say, I think it's the colleagues on that call, really proactive in terms of that working group. And I attended one of their more recent meetings where they presented all of the work that they've done around the looking after our people agenda. And it was really important to share that because part of the purpose of the People Board is to share a, a across the wider partnership. There are many, many aspects of this that I could reference, but I think two key pieces, they're doing some fabulous work around the compassionate leadership agenda. And they'd had a great culture, uh, compassionate culture conference. It was the second of those. And it says in my paper how many people had attended. And there is absolutely something about ensuring we develop our managers to ensure that they are well equipped to look after our people. And you'll know that within even the long term workforce plan of the NHS, retention is a key aspect. So that compassionate culture is, is really key piece. They, they'd also done some great work with some of our smaller organisations and a particular initiative around the social care wellbeing agenda. And this was that roadshow across our care homes because it's very often um, making sure that we can offer our wellbeing services in areas where it might not be as, as, as regularly accessible. And I think some, some great reports through the discussions of the People Committee in terms of the, the work that's really happening across Kirklees in, in, in that area and some of the obvious impacts that that was having for, for colleagues who perhaps, as I said, it isn't quite so straightforward for them in terms of being able to access support. You'll be aware from, from previous presentations that one of the pieces last year we were delighted with is at the close of some financial funding around the West Yorkshire Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub, that within West Yorkshire, a business case was presented and the decision was taken that we would find the resources to continue that wellbeing hub. Um, and, and I'm really delighted about that because I know colleagues from, from across the country are, are um, you know, sort of perhaps looking at that with envy that we've been able to, to establish that now on a really substantive basis. So we had a great sort of discussion and presentation with colleagues who lead the hub. They are developing the ongoing specification to make sure, importantly, for all of us across the partnership, that the hub is doing what we need it to do and is, is targeting and addressing that the, the areas, again, that we believe the services are most greatly required. And I think that long term process of, of making sure that we have that part of the work of the hub is building capacity around that mental health well-being across all of our services. So they presented um, their specification to, for, for the next iteration and, and colleagues from the People Board on behalf of everybody were, were able to feed back um, that that work remains ongoing. And again, I'm sure if, if it would be useful at some point, we can hear from the Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub in terms of the work right across the, the system. And very briefly, our second theme was around new ways of, of delivering care. 
um, and, and a couple of areas. I invited colleagues from primary care to come and share some of the work that they are doing. Again, I was lucky enough to attend one of their more recent workforce steering groups for primary care and, and recognising, obviously, some of the challenges that, that we understand around the recruitment and retention agenda. And, of course, in terms of, of some of the aspects of, of work and how, how to address some of these pieces, but we received a really proactive update from colleagues who sit on, on the workforce steering group for primary care. Looking at the primary care networks, for example, and how the, the, the people plan within primary care can actually support those networks. And, and we heard some great examples, including around flexible staffing pools and how some of the additional roles reimbursement scheme money, it's known as ours, for, for those who aren't familiar with it, has been used to support some of those workforce priorities. And a really great practical example about the rotational scheme between Yorkshire Ambulance Service and Primary Care for some of our paramedic medics was, again, a, a, a really important piece for the wider people board to be aware of. I, we also had a presentation with regards to our workforce observatory. And for those who aren't familiar, we have had an observatory in operation since 2020. And it's currently hosted by Bradford University, but it's a multidisciplinary research function. Again, the funding that was, was issued at the, at the start um, is drawing to a close. So my own team are leading. They have done quite an, a lot of engagement already around the appetite for, for ensuring that we can continue. I mean, workforce planning within the people plan is a huge key part of our strategic ambitions. Um, and I think certainly the sense from the people board is that the observatory would be a, a great supporting tool and advocate and ability to, to take drive some of that work forward. It, there's more work to be done on the business case. It was a shared sort of opportunity to test this with the people board. So, again, happy to take that forward. I'm conscious of time, so I will pause there. Um, I did do a, a brief update on the ICB workforce, so yeah, the operating model review. And, and just to flag that the themes for the next meeting are belonging to the West Yorkshire Partnership and growing for the future. It's, it's key to say that we have a really active agenda and I also already have presentation requests from our voluntary sector because they've had a significant workforce report that's come through recently and I know Joe Baker and Kim wish to share and present and discuss some of the particular workforce aspects for the voluntary sector and it would go without saying me that the national NHS long-term workforce plan um, I will be doing a detailed piece around that at the people board which is due to take place later this month um, Yes, we could talk forever about the, the range of items that come through the People Board, but I'll pause there, Councillor Swift, and happy to take any questions or indeed to pick up any particular queries with people outside of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate, and thank you for the work that's been done taking forward the uh, the, the living wage work. Um, Tim Gilpin, please. Thank you, Councillor Swift, and, and thanks for that, Kate. Very comprehensive comprehensive and very helpful. Uh, it's just to say um, to colleagues that the, the issue and, and the work that's been done on the rotational paramedics, I think, is just an excellent example of how um, uh, paramedic practice has come on over the last few years. And I think there's an increasing role that we can um, uh, provide into health communities, particularly in the context of um, uh, bed blocking and earlier discharge from hospital, uh, care in people's homes, and indeed, as, as you pointed out, Kate, the, the, um, uh, in primary care as well. Um, I'll leave it there, but it's just to say that if anyone um, uh, is interested in working with us on that, I'm sure we'd be very interested in talking to you about it. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swift. Thank you. Uh, Fatima? Thanks, Chair. It was just to sort of add to, to Kate's update regarding uh, the people plan and the publication of the NHS Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Improvement Plan. Um, it has some specific high profile actions that most NHS organisations need to consider. But I just think it's really important for us to keep an eye on some of the outcomes of the plan, even though it is an NHS plan, because they will have implications for a lot of the agenda items we've discussed today. So 
for example, if people don't feel psychologically safe within an organisation or they experience discrimination, they're less likely uh, to escalate health and safety concerns. If people don't feel welcome or they belong within the organisation, they're more likely to leave. Um, so it's just a sort of like that. It's very much on our radar. Kate's been instrumental, as has Ian Holmes, and we will hope to sort of include elements of the EDI plan as part of the review work. Um, in the impact of inequalities impacting our communities and staff, but also to see where it links with the ongoing people plan work too. Thank you. Um, Rob? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Kate, for the report and for bringing it here. Um, I think it's worth just um, getting into the practice of escalating any risks or issues here that we believe require a collective response. Um, I'm conscious that um, people should be aware that the changes to NHS England merging with Health Education England, you know, their running cost budgets in NHS England HE and their overall budgets being squeezed may impact upon the capacity we have to support this agenda as a partnership in the future. So I'm just putting that down for the record. And then I think there are some other bits of work which partners may be aware of, which I think we could probably socialise here a bit more uh, and also ask the people board to pick up. So the first is that um, NHS chairs and chief exec, well, NHS chief execs, chief people officers uh, will have received uh, a paper and a report that was done by uh, colleagues in the North East Yorkshire and Humber which shows that we have a 1% premium on sickness in our uh, staff. So we have a, a thousand more people off every day than the England average because of health inequalities faced by those people and some actions that we might take to address that. So um, I know that that might be something the People Board picks up as well, Kate, as part of its work on retention and presenteeism. And then the other piece is the work that you're leading on behalf of the DASIS about what's our social care workforce strategy. And I'm mindful that, you know, Bradford's doing some really great work on this through their Care Academy. Uh, we've got good practice and opportunities all over the place. So be good to be cited on those sorts of things at some point. Thanks very much, Rob. Kate, is there anything you want to come back on? Those points. No, thank you. I, th I think Rob raises some good points. I'm, I'm really mindful that, um, that this this report reflects the, what what went through the previous people um, boards. So, but, but there is, a, I guess, a wider opportunity. One of the two, the points you've just said there, particularly about the social care workforce, it might be at some point it'd be useful to have a bit of a specific um, reference to that for the partnership board. Um, not not just because it happens to have been at the people board prior. So, um, no, I'm happy with those comments. Thank you. And apologies, Rob, you were absolutely right to flag the risk. Um, you know, I, I, I know every area can, can say this, but uh, I, I think strategic planning and strategy around the workforce agenda is absolutely critical. And, you know, we are working closely with our colleagues from NHS England Regional Office, but uh, that, that, that there is going to be some level of impact and, and reduction. I have a really active embedded team within the People Directorate and that team will be noticeably reducing. So I think you're absolutely right to... To, to flag that so thank you thanks very much kate so i can receive a note that report and move us on then to final item partnership ambitions forward plan and um ian can i bring you in yeah. thanks very much councillor swift um swift relatively brief item this so uh Back in March, we, we did two things when we met in the council chamber in, in Leeds. The first thing we did was we agreed our refreshed five-year strategy um, and confirmed our 10 big ambitions as a partnership uh, for the next five years in public. Um, and we had a development conversation about how we want the partnership board to work um, and how we can get a bit more focused and specific um, around those delivery of those 10 big ambitions and particularly around you know what the mutual accountability approach um, is in relation to those 10, 10 big ambitions recognizing that it's not a small team working at West Yorkshire that's going to deliver those things it's the partnership working together in a coordinated way to deliver them um, across across the services that we provide um, so what the paper does really is um, describes a bit of a um, a bit of a uh, approach that we could take um, to um, 
get into more detail um, in a more structured way around the Timberg ambitions um, and then a forward plan for how we might use the time for the next five meetings to um, get into those more detailed conversations on the temp to ambitions. This won't be the sole focus of those meetings and um, we'll still do things like the chief exec's report, we'll still bring the workforce reports to etc but having a bit more of a focused approach around two ambitions is what we're proposing um, in, in each of those forward meetings. Um, so I, I guess the, the high level approach we've set out in slide, in paragraph six in the paper. Um, the first thing is we want to um, be clear on the data um, and be clear on the data that we're using to understand how we're doing against those ambitions. Um, we want to be clear and honest about the progress that we're making um, and look at the variation in the progress that we're making across different parts of, of our partnership in relation to those ambitions. Um, and the third thing really is we want to have a conversation <laughs> around um, what we might do uh as a as, as a partnership to uh, further progress those things or unblock blockages that we're seeing in the system or you know or support systems or spot sort of parts of the system that might be struggling um to deliver those so um you know mutual accountability as we've said is key to this this isn't about the the west yorkshire holding part of the system to account this is about creating a shared set of ambitions um and then having honest conversations as partners um as to how we're delivering those ambitions um, so at the end of the paper, we've um, we, we've we've got a little table which sets out a proposed forward plan. Um, I'm after support for the the approach that we're describing here, as well as the forward plan um, set out in that table. Um, the final thing I'll mention is the role of um, SROs, senior responsible officers, is important here. So those ten big ambitions are linked to a program. Uh, which has a senior responsible officer who's drawn from the partnership. It's part of our distributed leadership model, and um, we see them having a really important role um, in, in sort of helping to coordinate and run these sessions um, in the partnership board as well. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, Councillor Swift, um, and keen to get the partnership support for that um, proposal and forward plan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. So, colleagues, are we OK with that? Do we feel that reflects the... Uh... The approach we want to take coming out of the, the previous development sessions. Yep, that looks good. Uh, Brody, yeah. Ian, just can you talk a bit more through where we are then at, at this point in terms of taking this forward? We had the very helpful conversation this morning. Are you in the process now of, of measuring or developing strategies or identifying um, further data? So um, a little bit of all three, Brody. We've got a, a strategy and a joint forward plan which describes how we're going to do the work. Um, we've got a method for measurement of, of progress against 10 big ambitions, um, and we shared that with the partnership board previously, but we ha we do have a set of metrics that we use to, to measure progress. Um, this is really about sort of almost taking stock um, in a bit more detail in the, in the partnership boards in the future. So the data are telling us this in terms of the progress that we're making. These are the plans that we've got in place to oversee delivery. Is that working? Are things moving in the right direction? Are any parts of the partnership after more support around that? So it's a, it, it's not starting from scratch, if that's the question. It reflects the sort of the work that we've already been doing. And this morning, the conversation, a lot of it was around kind of um, what is the starting point for this? It'll be different for different, um, for example, NHS trusts. There'll be other targets that they'll have um, in other areas, um, and, and but but you're now saying this is this is game on. This is now starting. Yeah, I, I think what we're saying is we want to use the the, the partnership board time to have more of a, a a detailed and structured conversation in relation to specific ambition. Clearly, you know, as as, as we uh, rehearsed in the development session earlier this afternoon, this isn't the only thing that partners. In, in, in this partnership are accountable for, but we've all signed up to these 10 ambitions and we want to be able to have, you know, I guess have a bit more of a deep dive in terms of tracking progress, understanding barriers and having a conversation about what we can do to support each other to progress really. So, so, so it's a description of a tracking progress process. Sorry, Brody, say that, ask that again. It's, it's, a, it's a tracking progress process well, that you're inviting it's, us to agree to. 
Yeah, it's it's a bit more than a tracking progress. I guess we want to start with the data and we want to start with the perspective of what, where are we against this ambition using the, the, the agreed um, metrics that we said we'd use to measure it. Um, and then it's a conversation about are we on track, are we off track, or what are the systemic reasons for that? Is there anything we can do to support partner organisations that might be struggling to deliver it? So it's, it's not just a kind of a a dashboard and where are we conversation it's more of a we use the data to start and then we get into a conversation about uh, what's really going on i suppose okay thank you thank you uh councillor tim swift has asked me just to chair as deputy chair of the partnership in our uh, i'll take chair's privilege until anyone else puts their hand up thank you for the forward plan uh linked to the 10 big ambitions there was something that came out from the development session earlier today about how there shouldn't just be reporting from West Yorkshire's point of view, it should be drawing in best practice, learning, opportunities, innovation across places and providers as well. So if we take our ambition around achieving a more diverse uh, leadership in, our, in health and care, it would be helpful to hear from people, for example, on how they have implemented the uh, West Yorkshire Inclusive Recruitment Toolkit and the learning that they've gained from that. We had a really productive West Yorkshire uh, board chairs discussion earlier today on greater diversity and new non-execs and chairs coming into our system, particularly in the NHS and what we can do together on that. So uh, I think it it supports not only demonstrating the delivery of the strategy, which many people on, uh, in this forum have asked for for a good while now. How do we know that we're doing the right thing and this is working, as well as that exchange of best practice as well? Does anyone yeah, else have any... Sorry, Ian, do you want to respond? Yeah, and I think the point that you make there is really important. It's recognising that, as, as I've said, it's not a small people, small number of people working in the ICB that's going to deliver reductions in inequalities. It's going to be, uh, you know, contributions from NHS trusts, local authorities, VCSC partners, and so on and so forth. So it's it's trying to sort of build that ethos into it, which will mean that it'll not be um, just just sharing the kind of the West Yorkshire bits of work. It'll need to be broader than that, as, you, as, 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 as you're rightly saying. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments at all? I'm just wondering, do the timings of those themes work well, particularly if there are any national reports or certain times of year when things are reported on or required? Rob, did you want to come in? Yeah, I think it looks good. And I think the I think Brody's question is a really good one. And it leaves me thinking that as we implement the new operating model for the ICB and we have delegated authority money responsibility to places that the way in which we use this approach in places will be really important and the way that, that then feeds into the dashboards that we use in places is going to be really important so um there's probably some work for us to continue to do in that space because i guess part of what Brody's game on comment might be about I'm sort of sorry, Brody, if I'm sort of second guessing here a little, is uh, if it's game on, do, are we are we measuring our contribution? And are we doing that in our institution? Are we doing that in our place? And can we see it reflected back in what we see here? Because we should. Thank you. Um, so I think the work that Ian and the team are doing around this uh, needs to reflect um, those comments. Thank you. And a point earlier that you made, Rob, about that connectivity between health and wellbeing boards and place committees as well in there, working together, um, reflecting on what they're achieving and their plans for the next year to five years or so feels relevant. Um, Brody, do you want to come back on that? Game on. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think, there is, I think there are more discussions, actually. I mean, yeah. I think in terms of where the responsibility rests with this, It'll rest, of course, with the provider, but it'll rest to a degree with place, and it seems to also be resting with the the ICB, perhaps. And and it's just knowing how that balance is going to work its way through, and it's knowing what still has what still has to be defined and almost invented in part of the strategic um, focus across the piece um, that different providers will have to deliver for their own places, of course, moving forward. Um, so there's, so there's, it, it was a bit in, the, in terms of the conversation this morning, I'd said with very clear in the ambition, very clear in the outcome desire, but there's a big chunk in the middle there somewhere about who, the how, the accountability, the delivery, the funding, perhaps, yeah. as to how that might follow the 
um, ambition to take these forward. Yeah, and, the, and, it's, and, the, and the other and the other the other priorities that trusts and organisations will have, mm-hmm. and and there can't just be dropped off. For example, the work we're doing with children at the moment in terms of pulling that together, in terms of cans in the community, and um, that's one of our big ambitions actually is to get that um, into as good a place as we can. So there are existing ambitions and desires and um, objectives that, that are around. And it's working out the clarity of how this weaves in with that uh, in, a, in a way that's going to deliver successful outcomes across the piece. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. That's helpful. Ian, do you want to respond? I wonder if there's something that uh, you and colleagues within the ICB want to do, as well as uh, an ask out to colleagues working with place committees and health and wellbeing boards, a point of reflection and action planning? Or yeah, I mean, got I, enough? I think it's a- it's a really it's a really helpful conversation to get into and i think you know that question about the balance of providers versus players versus icb you know the, the obvious answer is it, it differs depending on the ambition so some of them are quite local authority focused some of them are quite weaker pointing and some of them are more nhs and, and i think what what jen was introducing earlier this afternoon was that logic model approach which starts to describe the sort of the actions and the responses that different partners uh, might take in relation to those different ambitions and having some of that um, work done ahead of the conversation so we start to get a sense of you know where we think the actions are and where we think the balance of responsibility might be um, is really important for others you know like adoption of the um, in- inclusive um, recruitment tool it's it's much more of a kind of a, a blanket thing we'd expect everyone to do it but for, for the inequalities ones there's a lot to um, you know there's a lot going into that mix isn't it? and there's quite a lot to understand as part of that so um, I think it's a really uh, helpful conversation something we'll reflect on before before that next meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, That's really helpful. Um, I'm going to hand back now to Councillor Swift to uh, finalise the meeting as chair. Um, But Ian, thank you very much. And we know this is a year where we're going to be testing those metrics and measuring our impact as well. So it's a point of learning throughout uh, the next 12 months. Um, Tim, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Cathy. Thank you for stepping in. Um, So that brings us to the end of the agenda. Thank you very much, colleagues. We've not had any notice of any other business. Um, Rob, over to you. So, so I was just going to, I was going to give a reflection and then I was going to just remind people of something which I should have mentioned earlier, which I've mentioned, but I'm going to mention it again. Uh, so uh, the reflection would be, uh, if uh, I don't know what, what people, what screen people have got in front of them. I've got a screen with 20 people on it, which looks very representative of the population that we serve and looks very different from the screen that we had when we started this partnership board. So I think we are, make, you know, we're starting to visibly look different, I think, as a partnership. I think the just the reminder is that it is Know Your Numbers Week. And you, you might think that this is just another one of those uh, typical weeks uh, where we have a campaign, but actually, one third of people, one third of adults in the UK have high blood pressure. You saw earlier from Jen's presentation that hypertension is a problem uh, in terms of mortality. It's actually the biggest driver of mortality for health conditions. And a third of adults have hypertension, half of them don't know or, or aren't having any treatment. And that's probably some of us so you knowing your numbers, having your blood pressure check is a good thing to do and good thing to encourage throughout your organisation. It's a whole raft of opportunities to have your blood pressure taken in all the places that we live and work at the moment. And you can get it done uh, in your local GP. In my practice, you just walk in and you can do it yourself or you might do it in your uh, pharmacy or some of the pop-ups that we've got. But um, it is one of those things that we might want to focus on. In the future so just to say if you haven't get yours done uh, somehow and um, you might find out that you need to do something about your blood pressure but please uh, please promote it in your organization and place thanks very much rob and thank you everybody for your contributions today uh next meeting is the 5th of december and i think the intention is to hold that in person somewhere in Calderdale, ideally so um, I look forward to seeing you all in person then. But I'm sure we'll see each other on other meetings long before. Thank you very much.
Thank you so Thank you. much, everyone. I'm glad Thank to be you. part of the family. <laughs> see you. Thank you. Thanks, Good Sarah. to see you, Tracy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.